My guest this week on Cleaning Up is somebody that I've known for nearly two decades. Rachel Kite, CMG, is the 14th Dean of the Fletcher School at Tufts University, first woman to lead that institution. Before that, she was the Chief Executive Officer of Sustainable Energy for All, where I was on the high-level advisory group. And she was also Special Representative for the United Nations Secretary General for Sustainable Energy for All. Prior to that, uh, Rachel was at the World Bank Group, where she was uh, Vice President, Special Envoy for Climate Change. Uh, and before that, she was at International Finance uh, Corporation. So uh, she has been doing uh, work on the climate for a very long time before switching to the uh, Fletcher School. She is a Brit, I'm pleased to say. Um, and um, CMG, for those of you who uh, don't know all of the terminology, means that she's a companion of the most distinguished order of St. Michael and St. George. So she's desperately grand and posh, as you're about to find out. Rachel, let, let me bring you into the conversation. How are you? I'm fine, Michael. It's lovely to see you. Two Brits abroad. That's right. Absolutely. Where are you now? Explain to everybody. Where, where are you sitting at the moment? So I am in my uh, home in Lexington, Massachusetts, which, of course, is important to us Brits because it's where uh, uh, <clears throat> a certain battle was uh, lost. Um, and I'm about uh, five miles from the campus of Tufts University, which is in Medford. And we've lived here for a few months now. And actually, our house uh, is made with recycled concrete and steel from the Big Dig. So if anybody knows anything about infrastructure, the Big Dig was the biggest infrastructure project in the United States at that time, about 20 years ago. And one of the enterprising vice presidents for one of the construction companies decided that to throw all of, all of the stuff away just seemed to make no sense. And he built a rather exciting house from it. And we bought so that house last year. And the big dig was in Boston. It was where they put the elevated, the L, uh, put it underground, and all the rats came out of the reclaimed um, uh, ground, didn't they? Well, yeah, I don't know if you know right. that bit. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so that was after I was at business school. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, was it 20 years ago? Good Lord. Um, but anyway, yes, the big, the big dig. Um, I, I hope at least it delivered the benefits. You know, you, having done so many cost benefits on infrastructure investments, we could probably use that as a starting <laughs> point, whether it actually delivered. But let's actually start with um, climate, um, because, you know, before you were at Tuft and before COVID, which will probably also kind of come into the conversation, um, you were probably as close to the epicentre of climate action as anybody could possibly be, both at the World Bank and then at Sustainable Energy for All. And you said, and I want to quote this, you said in a tweet uh, at the end of last year, so just before COVID, you said, we have a decade to ensure clean, affordable, reliable energy for all. And we can. And I love that. And we can. Um, can you talk us through 10 years? We can do it. And we can, you know, the, 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 uh, particularly the and we can piece. Yeah, I mean, so in the framework in the framework of the United Nations, the sustainable development goals, the sort of development enterprise, as it were, the climate uh, action, you know, you're really talking about uh, making the energy systems of the world, uh, and I say systems plural, right, um, really a lot more uh, efficient. Uh, use, you know, energy productivity has to be much more than it is today. Uh, we obviously need to shift from fossil fuels to renewable energy, um, and we then need to um, ensure that everybody has access to energy and, and it's affordable and reliable. And we have system inertia, we have incumbency, uh, which fights against uh, innovation. Uh, we have mindsets which prefer centralised and which prefer and understand the way we've always done things. Um, uh, and those are really the barriers. Uh, finance is something that can always be engineered. Technology is uh, proving us wrong every year, as you always comment, right? Uh, and the work that you did at Bloomberg, New Energy Finance Unit, you know, sort of just showing how uh, quickly things could potentially go. Um, so the finance and the technology 
uh, can be uh, brought to the table, I think. Um, and also there's lots of technology we have today that we just don't deploy. We're always looking for the silver bullet. It's sort of a, a plague upon our house as a human species. Um, and so I, I think there's a large part of this is, is about being determined to do it. And what I saw when I was at Sustainable Energy Fall is that the countries, the leaders, the business leaders that just sort of determine that, um, that they're going to go for it, whatever go for it might mean, actually were able to make extraordinary progress. Um, uh, and sort of the companies, countries that sort of didn't take the weight off their back foot as they crossed the stream, right? So they were sort of hedging, um, ended up faffing around, really. And you see that in oil company leadership, you see that in utility leadership, you see that in country leadership, uh, from prime ministers to governors to mayors. Um, those who uh, you're kind of committing and sort of then organizing everybody to sort of come in and, and fill the gap uh, are, are making extraordinary progress. So we said in 2030, we would do this. And, you know, uh, we've got 10 years to do it. And lots of things are working to our benefit. Price of renewables, understanding of what works, decentralization, digitalization, all working in our favor. Hopefully now COVID reminding everybody that we actually need resilience, which means that you need functioning uh, systems. Um, and so the only thing that kind of trips us up is ourselves. But in a sense, when you said um, we can, you know, we've got 10 years uh, and we're going to do these things. Do, were you referring, do you think, specifically to the developing world getting energy access? Or, you know, because I'm known as an optimist, right? And, um, and I think that we're going to see peak emissions. I wrote about it at the end of last year. <laughs> peak emissions are closer than, uh, the, than you think. And here's why. That was obviously, I did, wasn't thinking of COVID. I was thinking of the trends. Um, but I was looking at, you know, 2030, maybe we'll have seen the peak and maybe it'll be down five, maximum 10% um, globally. But that's developed world, China, developing, well, that's the whole lot. Um, so you, your optimism about, what we can do in 10 years, was that, you know, are you being more optimistic than me or are you, do you think you're, you're sort of, were you more, becoming more optimistic about the developing world and getting energy access into people's uh, homes and so on? Yeah, so I, think, so I think I'm about as optimistic as you are. I, and I mean, sometimes I'm rhetorically sort of just sort of trying to cut through the, well, on the one hand, on the other hand, and, and, and sort of what, I'm, and what I've seen is leaders saying, we're going to do this. We might not know every step of the journey. We might not know every possible policy, you know, innovation. But you know, we are going to set off on that journey with the determination to get there, and we'll figure it out as we go. Those leaders make more; they make greater, greater progress than those who are sort of waiting for everything to be ironed out, every T to be crossed, every I to be dotted before they set forth on the journey. So I think I was going there rhetorically, but yeah, in terms of uh, access. Um, the if you look at who really doesn't have access to energy today, and we're talking about people who don't have access to anything, they are the rural poor. They are living in fragile and conflict-affected countries. They are living in the peri-urban, uh, you know, sort of informal settlements of fast-growing cities and towns in Africa, and uh, it's going to require um, some really spirited. Um, public sector interventions with lots of private sector ingenuity to get power to them, but we can get decentralized renewable power enough for them to participate meaningfully in the economy if we want to. We will always be pushed back by more wars, we'll always be pushed back by conflict. And so whether we get 100%, I don't know, but there is absolutely no reason to believe that we can't. And there's a big problem for us geopolitically if we don't, because the numbers of people who don't have access to energy today are concentrating in sub-Saharan Africa. And so this really becomes a story of Africa rising. Uh, and this becomes a story of uh, African investment in Africa, of uh, stopping capital flight, of private investment, understanding the, you know, the innovation that's possible in those markets. It's about letting innovation fly, so not importing solutions from the rest of the world and having them grow from the ground up. But there's no reason why it can't be done. And how do you answer with it? Because you've been such a sort of, this is exactly the, message that you've been sending out for as long as i've known you that you know you just have to lean in and just you know just do it and that progress and in fact the, you know your point about those people that do lean in actually make remarkably fast progress and the costs come down i mean we've seen it actually across 
um, different areas of environmental progress. It's not just climate, but also whether it's um, socks and knocks or yeah. uh, what you know. It, everybody said, "Oh, it'll be so expensive to deal with problem X," and then when you actually do it, it's not that expensive. You have capital asset cycles. You start doing smart stuff. The other stuff gets more and more expensive, and pretty soon nobody can remember what the whole fuss is about. I mean, we're not quite at the no, nobody remembers, but um, so you you've been sending that message for a long time, but. Do you know, how have you, you, you've probably been faced, and I'm thinking maybe back to a decade ago within the World Bank, more than at SE for All, with people saying, no, 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 this is a, that's a rich country game to do clean energy and to do this expensive stuff and to deal with the environment and energy efficiency. And that is absolutely not the thing. It's not the priority. And, you know, there was uh, Alex Epstein, he wrote a book called The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. Um, he wrote it in 2014. And his thesis was people need energy. Energy makes people wealthy. Energy pulls people out of poverty. Energy powers health systems. And you and people like you and me as well are immoral. I mean, that's the, the implication of yeah. fossil fuels having a moral case is that non-fossil fuel, you know, alternative, renewable, uh, et cetera, are immoral how do you answer them? If you were sort of stuck in an elevator with Alex Epstein, what would you say to him? Well, I think in, in so in twenty fourteen, you know, we were still arguing about whether coal was cheaper than renewables, right? And and, and the, this argument was going on in full hue and cry, uh, and there was also um, it, it cut across a, a separate argument, which was that the development world was focused on poverty alleviation. And they didn't see that climate was a poverty alleviating argument. So that it was like poverty versus climate. And they spent years um, arguing in, inside the bank and also arguing with people like, you know, uh, DFID uh, specialists who were, you know, we are about alleviating poverty. And I'm like, in that case, we have to arrest climate change because climate change is going to push people back into poverty. Uh, and that argument still, I mean, I mean, it's more or less one, but I mean, there's still pockets of that. But in 2014, yes, it was an argument of coal is the cheapest way to get uh, access to energy to those who don't have it, except that, except that it had never happened, except that the way that centralised grid systems with coal-fired power plants being popped up here or there were always going to rely on very inefficient transmission systems, and those transmission systems were never going to reach those you know, marginal communities of people who don't have power. And so, you know, the, the, the rhetorical retort was like, well, yeah, but you've been trying it for, you know, a few decades now and you never got there. And what kind of subsidy are you going to want from the government now to connect that family and connect that family? Meanwhile, uh, you know, we were learning much about decentralization. We were learning a lot around, uh, around renewables. And I remember being at the IFC, um, so the International Finance Corporation, the private sector part of the World Bank, um, when uh, Lars Tunnell arrived, uh, the Swiss uh, banker and now uh, um, investor in, in green new technology, and he arrived and he was like, why is the IFC not investing in off-grid at scale? Uh, and I think that, you know, he arrived at IFC in 2006, December 2006, and this was a question he asked in 2007, 2008, and he was getting a little bit of traction and then the financial crisis hit and we became a counter-cyclical lender and that all sort of went for a little bit, but he was asking those questions then. I think he was right to. But I would say that what happened then is as renewables started to become cheaper or as cheap as coal, and certainly more easily deployable to where the people who don't have power were, then you started seeing Peabody Energy and those guys coming in and subsidizing and paying for a massive advertising campaign around coal is the answer to energy poverty. And they used to buy banners on the FT's website and things like this. And so then it became whack-a-mole. I mean, it, be, it became political campaigning. But in 2014, it was still an argument about price. But some of the people, I mean, you, Medupe um, power station in South Africa, I mean, that was a big fight around 2014, I think. And, you know, and then there was yeah. a sort of triumphant coal uh, brigade that said, you know, finally we saw reason and we were able to put money in. And there was this, I don't know, was it how many billion dollars and how many gigawatts? And it was just a, a, a huge... And, of course, now it's seen as this monstrous white elephant that has yeah. you know, is, is bringing down uh, ESCOM as, it, um, as, as we knew it. Have you met any of the people who sort of fought such a hard campaign within the World Bank and within the development community to kind of support 
those power stations? Have you met any of them recently? Have any of them said, you know, gee, you were right, and God, we were not just wrong, we were really wrong? Well, I was, I was uh, when the first decision to invest uh, in those plants was made, I was, I was the vice president at IFC that was handling environment and social issues and, uh, and also the investment on sort of um, uh, climate issues. And the one good thing that came out of those deals was this sort of the setting aside of investment that would be then go into solar and wind. So it was, you know, in exchange for building these coal-fired power plants, there would be all of this investment. And the team that worked on that, um, who, uh, who have split now, one of them's got their own consultancy in, in, in Washington, one's working for an insurance company in the Netherlands, and they've, I think they've all sort of split in different directions. But that team put together some of the most innovative financing at scale of solar and wind uh, in, on the African continent at that time. I think my, my predecessors at the bank, and then I, I was still at, I was at the bank then when we had to make the decision to, um, uh, to uh, put the next tranche of money in, right? And that was a very painful decision. That was just before uh, Paris, uh, but by then sort of the, the, the sort of die had been cast. You know, it would be interesting to talk to. I haven't talked to the individuals uh, concerned, but I, I think that uh, these are extremely difficult geopolitical decisions at the time that they are made. And at this t- at the time, I mean, I, you know, there are others that I could go back and look at as well. But at that time, there were, Af- I mean, there's, and there still are to this day, right? I mean, the Africa Development Bank has only just resolved where it really comes down on coal in the last few months. And the Japanese were pushing them really hard up until very recently to continue to leave the door open for coal. Um, you know, the, the argument was very strongly that, uh, you know, we have a right to develop and we will choose how we develop, and that includes choosing our energy systems. And, I, you know, I was in meetings, uh, you know, after that where, uh, you know, African leaders, elected leaders would say, look, we would rather, you know, um, we, we would rather have dirty energy uh, than be dead on the bottom of the Mediterranean. And uh, I, I think that's evolved now. I think you've got a generation of finance ministers and leaders in Africa who are making real change, Ethiopia, Kenya, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Senegal. Um, but, you know, the, you can only get out, you can't get that far out ahead of your audience, as it were. But um, when you see, you know, when, when you see that there is still, um, you know, coal-fired power stations being financed, whether by the Japanese, by the Korean, by whoever, you know, whoever, and then, of course, there's the uh, the Belt and Road, which has um, got a few coal-fired uh, power stations and fossil assets. Do, do you just look at that and think, you know, why don't they read the script? Why don't they, you know, because they're, they're sort of doing what we were still doing. We, the, you know, the, the, yeah. the developed world, the Western world was doing, uh, or, the, you know, the, the Western world, because obviously, you know, Japan and Korea are to a certain extent still doing. But, um, you know, we were doing that in, by... T- by around 2014, 2015, it was just sort of, it was shutting down. It was yeah. obvious which direction it was going. But in 2010, we were still steaming, you know, s- straight towards those particular rocks. And you know, do you look at that and think, well, you know, just on the economics alone, they're just yeah, the going to be burning billions and tens of billions and maybe hundreds of billions of dollars? Well, the numbers don't work, but the, the, what the numbers absolutely don't work for people in the countries where these plants are to be built and which will re- will become white elephants. And so I, I actually get very angry. I mean, and I, you know, I used to get very angry when I was in the development business because um, I would see deals structured in a way that everybody would walk away whole, except for the taxpayer of the country where the deal is being produced, right? Because that's, that's where the, that's where, you know, the payments are going to be made if the, if the private sector, you know, can't meet it or, or can't, you know, whatever the deal was, if they can't get what they want, it would always be, you know, the 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 the, the last resort would end up with the taxpayer in the country, and so I, I um, the, the the people whose voices are not heard in this infrastructure are the people who don't have access to energy, uh, and if you if you ask them, you know, they they see a village being electrified, they want that. Uh, and they want it reliably, and they want it clean. They don't want to have bad air quality. They don't want to have their kids um, develop respiratory diseases. They want to be able to participate in the economy. And so um, the Belt and Road, I mean, I think a lot of the ones that are being commissioned or that are on paper at the moment, I don't think actually will get built. 
So I think that what we've got is a lot of, um, we've, well, in terms of COVID recovery, we've got a lot of, uh, we've got to throw things up because we've got to stimulate the economy, whether or not they ever um, are completed and whether or not they're ever um, used uh, or ever producing anything is another question. And then why Korea and Japan, um, having uh, started to embrace uh, sort of green recovery domestically, uh, why they would export this? Um, uh, I mean, I understand why, but I mean, I, I don't really. Uh, I, I think it's a travesty. I, I was going to say, I don't really understand why, because, you know, it's not so fabulous for, you know, their domestic industry in Japan or Korea to sell a couple of, you know, uh, steam turbines and coal fire. You, you think they would just, you know, OK, we understand that these are difficult geographies to go clean domestically, but why export? But that's a, you know, that, that's a that's probably a long discussion. Um, but, you know, there is that does raise a question that's at the heart of a lot of the kind of sustainable development that you've done and that I've been around, um, which is um, it's not that it's not so much um, it's not donations. It's actually investment now. And I guess I want to ask the question about is there a sort of downside to that, which is it's all very well if the model works, then you invest in the infrastructure, the energy system, the transport, etc., in the developing world, in a developing country. And hopefully they get really wealthy over the next sort of 10 or 15 years. And so providing the, the profits back to Western investors is not a problem. I mean, is it? Yeah, but, but what happens when it goes wrong? I mean, I guess there's two questions. Is that the right way to do it? You know, some of these countries which have been, you know, victims of colonialism have, you know, over over many, many decades, a long time ago. Should we be providing investors with positive returns by providing them with capital to develop? That's question one. Question two is what happens when it goes wrong? Do we just do another big debt restructuring? Well, because uh, there's a lot of questions wrapped up in there. I think that... Um... There's a large part of the development industry which is about perpetuating the development industry. Uh, and uh, I, you know, I, I wrestle with that. I wrestled with it while I was, quote unquote, part of the development industry, and I wrestle with it now. Um, so, but where I think, uh, where I've seen, where, where you've seen countries really emerge from, uh, from poverty after independence, um, and when you look at the countries that are really progressing, then they, they have taken control of their vision of their development. And then they are taking control of whose investment, under what terms, public or private, you know, from whom, and they're, ma they're making the decisions. And then they have the whip hand and then say, well, no, actually, we want the Norwegian government to come in, come in and give us, you know, technical advice on this. And then we will open it up for investment to these people uh, and, and, you know, and have moved very quickly. So uh, and there's different models of that. Everybody that I was working with in, in infrastructure and transport and energy when I was at the bank, you know, every African country or every Central American country that we work with wanted to be like Korea. They wanted to get it done in 35 yeah. years. Right. Um, and they were interested in Singapore. And so if we were going to be providing technical advice, it was to take bureaucrats from you know, from, I don't know, from Malawi and take them to Seoul so that they could see what light railway had done and, and what the transit corridors looked like. Or we could take them to Singapore and look at uh, modern building techniques and, and uh, things like this. So those are those are the models that inspire. But, you know, when Rwanda wants to become Africa's Singapore, that's what it, that's what it's trying to do. But if you look at the rate of uh, electrification in, in Kenya, you look at now the plans that are coming through in Ethiopia. So not just the Chinese big dams, but what they're going to do in the rural areas. You know, this is these are governments that know what they want and they're prepared to go out and get the partners that they want to deliver it for them. They're also very clever at how they use development aid. So they know what they want from the World Bank. They know what they want from a regional development bank. They know what they want from China and they know what they want from the Chinese owned banks. And so I think that that's when it really works. I think where it doesn't work is when you've got a weak government uh, or disorganized and weak government or, you know, worse, a corrupt government. And uh, then it's really um, it's a supply game. You know, it's the development industry is telling them what to do, but the ownership uh, isn't there. And of course, underneath all of that are, you know, the people and civil society and their ability to, to sort of be heard and be part of a vision of what they want their own country to look like. So um, it can work. Uh, 
it sometimes doesn't. And there's plenty of reasons for that, including the way that the development industry runs itself. And then I get really upset about sort of the, on the green side of development aid, where we put so many conditions and bells and whistles on uh, this fund or that fund or this new program. And we, we just uh, slice and dice the funding available to people so that there are, you know, every sort of government or, you know, has to like negotiate 16,000 different sort of ways of doing it just to get their hands on any scalable finance. Um, and that, of course, employs a lot of people in monitoring and evaluation. It employs a lot of people in the funds who, which are all managed in Europe or, or North America or outside of Africa or Central uh, America. And, uh, and I think that that, that becomes, uh, becomes self-defeating uh, in time. We, we will never get to scale if we, if we bifurcate the money that way. Yeah, no, I think, <coughs> no, I think that uh, articulates um, brilliantly, actually, um, how it can work and how it should work. Um, and I think that there's a sort of um, preconceived notion that these are all hopeless countries, and that the World Bank is sort of flying around uh, and, and sort of telling them what to do with its acolytes and the Africa Development Bank. So, and, and that's not, my, not been my experience at all. So you're highlighting that there are actually real success stories. And we're not talking yeah. about just uh, South Africa and just Morocco or whatever at two ends of the continent that are doing well. There are actually, uh, there's, the, there's the Ghanas and there's the Rwandas and there's the Ethiopias and there's the Kenyas uh, and there's the Tanzanias. And, the, and actually, there's an enormous amount of best practice and good stuff that's happening. And I think absolutely right. It, it, these have to be ultimately Africa-led initiatives. They have to be provided, meeting the needs uh, as perceived locally and not by you know anybody else so um I, you know i i'm very heartened that um that you've sort of summarized it and that there are those best practices and there are things that are uh, are really working because you know i i'm optimistic and i it's quite extraordinary after of you know how optimistic i guess here's my question i'm going to frame this as a question <laughs> do you think that you left sustainable energy for all more optimistic than when you first started to work with it I, that's a really good question. So I, um, I, I always describe myself as a hopeful pessimist um, because I think there's real power in the concept of hope uh, because it, 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 it's about agency. Uh, and then, I, you know, uh, the, the data makes you pessimistic, right? Uh, so I, 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 was, um, I was pessimistic about parts of the development industry's ability to just get out of the way and I was extremely hopeful because of the extraordinary, extraordinary uh, creativity, entrepreneurship uh, of financiers, of um, people running businesses, of you know competitions that we were part of that that sure showed extreme ingenuity around. And it, for me, it was all about asking the right question. I, I just felt that we spent a lot of time running down rabbit holes. You know, around the wrong question. You know that at the bottom, at the, at the bottom, there's always this question of, you know, how can we equitably um, and cleanly uh, ensure energy systems work for everybody? And and that's the question. You know, it's it's not you know should you spend this many you know billions on that much giga, gigawatts, right? Uh, so I so I the I felt that the development industry quote unquote got in the way sometimes. But I was humbled every day and extremely hopeful by by just the ingenuity that you would find. So I'm, I worked with um, Sustainable Energy for All um, when it was actually before it was first set up, when it was just mm. um, it was a, 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 a cross um, an, an interagency initiative um, that was set up by Kande Yamkala at the time. Uh, he was Secretary General of um, UNDP, I believe. And then he became your yeah, predecessor. Unido. Yep. Uh, at yep. UNIDO, not UNDP, UNIDO. Uh, and then he became the first uh, the, the first head of uh, SE for All. And I joined it, and my premise was very, very simple. I I think we're going to solve the electrification problem. Um, I know that, you know, at times you've sort of said, oh, the numbers are not there, you know, we're not going fast enough and, and been a bit, you know, depressed about that or, or, or you know, a bit less, less optimistic than today. 
Um, but I was always optimistic about electrification because it just seemed obvious that this stuff just gets cheaper and cheaper. It delivers benefits to people. And we've seen with mobile phone uptake in the developing world, in India, in Africa, in, in Latin America, Central America, you know, when, when it delivers benefits, people get hold of it somehow with or without our help. So I was always very optimistic. I'm less optimistic about things like cooking. Um, yeah. It's just so, so, so much harder of a problem culturally uh, numbers two was it 2.5 billion versus 800 million now that are still cooking with dung and wood and charcoal and you think oh you know my goodness how do we really uh you know we've only got 10 years for the se for all goals um so i don't know unless there's a unless there's something pretty dramatic there i think we're going to have trouble on on uh, on the cooking and heating side well just so just one thing on electrification one of the reasons why i used to get frustrated why i still frustrated is that so you're quite right right the the pathway of electrification is fairly clear and you know the the ability to zoom along that pathway is there and then when you think of what is the role of uh, of development finance or concessional finance it is to just sort of nudge it along where it needs to be and to make sure that it goes where it won't go on its own right so just to uh, act as a sort of smoothing of the way and what was frustrating is when we started tracking the financial flows into decentralized renewable energy access, we found that, you know, like 1% of the sort of $20 billion that was earmarked, that was flowing, was going into those kinds of solutions. So the, the public money was going, you know, it was lazy, basically, and, and just going in and doing easy things on the back of the front end of the revolution. And I'm like, no, the, the point of public money is you go in and you, you're, you're doing the things that no other form of money, you're drinking Heineken, you know, that, that no other form of money will do. So that was one frustration. On cooking, I actually think that, I, I, I think that there is, there are things that could go much faster, but we, we've got to sort of do the, the um, you've got to treat it like a serious uh, a serious problem that needs serious solutions. And it, it kind of always sort of gets treated as it's sort of, I don't know, uh, a nursery room problem or maybe because it's women that cook, I don't know. Uh, and so there is all kinds of sort of market data, sort of penetration analysis, all kinds of stuff that you would do if this was a serious market or even if there was ele- as we were talking about electrification that hadn't really got done for clean cooking. And then the other thing is that it, there isn't that people don't cook, they cook, but they cook... D- and that, you know, the charcoal is a, is a mafia business in a number of countries. I mean, it's, this is, you know, dangerous business, you know, so you've got incumbents. It's not like you're, you're, work, you're walking in and nobody cooks, right? So uh, I just felt there was a little naivete about the way in which we were attacking the problem. So um, there is money to be made in helping women predominantly get access to clean fuels for cooking. And as soon as people see it as a, a market of, of that kind, then then there's lots of, I think, uh, entrepreneurship possible. Um, but we've t- we tended to make it a development problem. And as soon as you make it a development problem, and you, then then you you sort of stymie some of the innovation that may be possible. But I, but I think there's there are parallels with how difficult energy efficiency and heating are in the developed world. Because, you know, electrification, you know, it, it, it's it's... It's technology. You can stick it on the blockchain. You can get venture capital. You can monetize. You can have scratch cards. There's a, you know, whereas cook stoves uh, is just it's just harder. So you know, you said it was lazy because it, you know, people were avoiding de- uh, the decentralized solution. I think that there are some systemic problems with the uh, the multilateral finance institutions. It's everything from how the careers are set up to um, you know, yeah. it's, just, it's just easier to do big chunks of project finance. Um, so that's hard. That's Absolutely. easier than distributed electricity. And then cook stoves gets really hard because it's just kind of, I mean, it's pretty low tech. And, and, yeah. uh, but um, but right. We have established now in the first whatever it is, half hour that you really, really know what you're doing in the uh, sustainable development, climate, clean energy um, uh, 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 and so on. But you chucked all that in and you went to. The Fletcher School. Now, you had studied at Fletcher, so you knew the institution well. Um, talk us through that change. It's a great institution. You know, I, I pulled out, actually, uh, when I was preparing for this, I, uh, you've got, um, you know, um, for those who don't know the Fletcher School, I mean, it's, it's uh, one of the preeminent 
um, international relations schools in the world, certainly one of the one of the you'll, you'll probably say it's the preeminent one in the US, but it's certainly, you know, right, right up there. Um, Juan Manuel Santos, president of Colombia, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize in 2016. Bill Richardson, who was um, secretary of energy as I was building new energy finance in those early, early years. Um, Michael Dobbs, Lord Michael Dobbs, uh, author of House of Cards, former advisor to Margaret Thatcher. So, you're, uh, you know, good, uh, a good Brit that, uh, that studied there. And Jeremy Rifkin, uh, economist, writer and futurologist, although um, I would say that I don't think he's ever actually predicted anything correctly, but then I'm just being mean and, 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 uh, and catty. But, you know, eminent, eminent people, fantastic institution. Um, did you ju- were you just sort of lured away by the glamour of it all to turn your back on, on the whole climate issue? No, it was, a, it was for once a very deliberate decision. So, I mean, for most of my career, I was... I hadn't really planned things and things sort of happened or people talked to me or um, or Bob Zellick called me up at six o'clock one afternoon and said, you're coming to the bank. You know, I mean, it, it, it wasn't necessarily uh, purposeful or mindful. Um, but I had got to the point where, um, I mean, for, for, for a long time, I had been uh, on a plane every Sunday night um, and on a plane many days during the week. And uh, I have to say, I had angst about that kind of flying uh, from a climate perspective, but also, you know, I've got two, well, they were preteens and um, uh, I just, I needed to be around more. So I needed to do a job where I wasn't on a plane all the time. I mean, this is pre-COVID, right, where none of us are on planes. Um, And uh, so I'd I'd sort of come to that uh, realisation and also, uh, a lot of the jobs that people talk to me about, I mean, people are always saying, well, Rachel, what about this? Or are you going to throw your hat in the ring for this or whatever? It w- were similarly structured jobs where I just knew I was going to have to sort of really go around the world and, and, and rattle a, a, a tin can. Um, and so it seemed to me that I was going to have to make a, a more a, a, a different kind of break. And so I set myself a time frame and I said, you know, by December... 2019 you need to know what you're going to do um and as as these things happen it's that was a conversation i was having with myself at the end of 2018 um and but i was i was literally having that conversation with myself and i and i got a phone call sort of saying did you know that um this position is now coming open and and whatever and so i threw my after a long period of discussion i decided to throw my hat in the ring and i was very lucky to get the job but it was for the first time that I actually decided that I needed to kind of step off uh, the merry-go-round a little bit. Um, the, the, other, the other reason for doing it is that I had become very, very uh, convinced um, that the, the, these generations, the younger generations, see the world in a very different way and they see possibility in a different way and they are uh, intersectional, they're interconnected in a different way. Uh, and I thought that, it, you know, actually to go and be around that generation in a, in a more purposeful way than the way I was would be would be uh, a way for me to contribute. I mean, I didn't want to walk away from the barricades, as it were, um, but I felt like I wanted to contribute in a different way. So that's and then COVID ha- happened. So nobody's traveling anyway. Um, and my kids are just getting used to having me around all the time at the moment. So, but it, So I think it's an absolutely brilliant move, I'm going to say. Um, because, um, and y- your point about young people see these challenges just in a very different way, um, it is, it, it, I mean, it's absolutely correct, not just that you're not just correct observationally, um, but it is correct to see these challenges in a different way. And, and the example that I always use is you've got this, you know, we, we have a kind of climate change and it's seen as an environmental issue, but climate action, uh, to my mind, first and foremost, is actually a trade issue and actually, it's, become, yeah. it's a very strong, it's obviously a political issue because the solutions, frankly, I hate to say it, are not that darn hard. They're hard when you put them into political tribalism and they're hard mm-hmm. when you put them into geopolitics and trade uh, policy because you could solve the problem and there might be some you know, interim period where you're disadvantaging certain sectors of your economy uh, and therefore it becomes a trade issue. But... If you come at it from the environmental, always it's always seen as, as being in the environmental silo. And uh, then, uh, frankly, 
that impedes progress because first of all you're not having the discussions when it's about trade you're sort of in the some little junior parallel thing about climate and uh, and and you've made it all massively more complicated by being you know the, the probably the number one touchstone issue for political polarization in the anglo-saxon world so if young people can come at it in a different way and say this is not you know this is not climate uh, and i don't mean overhyping and say oh this is survival and we're all going to you know but but if they can if they can just deconstruct the problem and put it into different buckets I, that is going to actually be really really refreshing in my view and i think so, frankly i think that we should be doing that as as leaders we should be much more prepared to say look it is not a you know it is not a an environmental junior issue it's actually core to well, it's, it's yeah. just part of everything um so i think that you know I, I, maybe i'm projecting my views onto your decision to sort of take your knowledge of climate and clean energy but embed it in a, a layer that's frankly closer connected to the levers of power i mean is that a fair i mean yeah no i think so i mean i, I so uh, we, te- we teach climate, we teach climate policy, we have a climate policy lab, we advise, you know, all kinds of people with that, we teach energy policy, but what I'm interested in is how we're teaching climate to um, to our military fe- fellows who are taking time out of the military and are going to go back, you know, into a world of, you know, AI controlled battlefield logistics and things like this. I'm interested in how we're teaching climate in the way we understand migration and the future of human rights law, right? So. For me, it, it just it is the context in which we do everything now, and the solutions are embedded in economic decision making and you know the, weaning ourselves off GDP, which doesn't really work for welfare or for the planet. It's you know how we see politics, how we see the relationship between nations. I mean, geographically, the Arctic is completely transformed by climate. Now means different actors need to be sitting around the table. That table looks very different, and the questions are very different. So. For me, it's it's everywhere. And what I've been really inspired by is the generation of leaders who kind of just understand that this is what it's all about for the next 20 to 30 years. Um, and so, you know, people talk about Jacinda Ardern a lot at New Ze- in New Zealand, but Meta Fredrickson, who came in in the summer of 2019 as a new young leader of uh, Denmark, and, and sort of Denmark already had aggressive climate goals. Um, and she made them even more aggressive. And what was really, what struck me about her speech uh, when she, and it was about a week after she'd been elected, was that she said, okay, this is the revised climate goal. And she'd run on, on climate as an issue, but climate was the number one polling issue for all Danes. Um, she said, look, you know, I don't know exactly um, how we're going to get there, but I trust in Danish business. I trust in the Danish public. And together we will figure this out. And, you know, that has a, a name. That is called, you know, in, in social psychology, that's reciprocal vulnerability. It's basically saying, I'm your leader. I'm committed. I um, don't know exactly everything. Uh, I'm not telling you that we're just going to, you know, trump our way over this bog and we're going to get there. But uh, we will do this and we will work this out. And, and I'm committed to it. That allows the public to then say, OK, this is our challenge too. And we can be part of figuring this out. It gives permission to the private sector, et cetera. Uh, and of course, there are very high levels of social trust in Denmark, you know, which are strengthened by that kind of leadership. Put that in stark contrast to some other countries, including, and we're recording this on the day when Boris Johnson just made his big uh, Roosevelt speech, right? Um, and you know, there's, there's all kinds of things that he could, he could do that he hasn't quite got right, I think, rhetorically yet, or maybe even substantively. So. You know where is the um, where is the core of people who are going to completely deal with the refurbishment of you know British buildings so that, so that they are hyper efficient? Uh, you know that's jobs, that's generation of local economies, that's you know and you, you don't get you know a point of CO two emissions for every flowery adjective. You know you're going to get CO two emissions reduction from good old fashioned you know. Let's roll up our sleeves and do this together. And, you know, it might be not very sexy in the context of the UK, but we see in countries where there is high social trust that they are able to get things done more smoothly. Yeah, in the UK context where I've been doing my bit to try to say, look, you know, actually, this is not a drag on the economy. Dealing with climate is not a drag on the economy. This kind of is the economy. 
Uh, this is, and we're actually in the UK, I believe, the UK is incredibly well positioned. You know, we're good at Absolutely. electrochemistry, we're good at finance, we're good at electrical engineering, we're good at architecture, we're good at, you know, all sorts of things uh, that you need um, in the future uh, economy. Yeah, so it's, it, I mean, to me, not to lean in, not to, not to be, um, and, the, but the funny thing is, we're also, we are leading. I mean, we're the, we're the G7, G20, you know, fastest decarbonizing economy, but we're doing it in a incredibly sort of, it's an incredibly British way to do it. We're doing it by mistake. You know, we put a, <laughs> a, a carbon floor price completely unexpectedly we have a floor <laughs> price on carbon that nobody was really asking for there was no political constituency for it and suddenly we got it and then it started to do these things we're like oh that's rather good oh jolly good uh, and that was good and then we decided to get rid of coal by 2025 oh let's just get rid of coal we'll get rid of coal the germans have this sort of very detailed process and they do vast models and they say you know they come out and they say oh, you know couldn't possibly do it before 2038 and we're you know the brits are doing, oh, well we just did it uh, well, it's, God it's bless, a, God bless the British civil servant. That's what I say. Well, I guess no, but but I, I don't know enough of the process that were behind those decisions. But they were transformation. There was something terribly British about muddling through to these incredible outcomes. Mm -hmm. I mean, may mm -hmm. it continue? Maybe, 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 uh, maybe it will continue. I hope it will. You know, the offshore wind, um, uh, you know, commitment, forty gigawatts of offshore wind, and you know, somehow I think we will muddle through and remain. Maybe not as it's maybe not the same style of leadership, or maybe not as good as. But you know, I don't know. Maybe I'm more of an optimist about the political process in the UK. You've been, uh, you and I have had our moments of disagreement on where we're. Well, uh, yeah, on, we don't need the... to go there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, but I mean, I, I, think, but the I, audience, think... I think the audience but... would rather enjoy relitigating Brexit. <laughs> I remember, I remember trying to litigate Brexit with you in, a, in an oak panelled lunchroom in some hotel in San Francisco. Uh, and for a clean management energy ministerial once, I uh, think um, that's right. It was a it was a friends of Michael lunch. That's and, right. Uh, that's right. And, and I and, was waxing lyrical about uh, about taking back control, I think, or some some such nonsense. Anyway, <laughs> but I but I do th but I do think that one of the other. I mean, I think it's eroding a little bit. But one one of the strengths of, of Britain is um, the public esprit de corps when under pressure. Right. So we don't need to get rose tinted glasses on and get all you know emotional about white picket fences in the 1950s but but there is something about you know the Brits when they get together and I and I do and I always felt that um, that one of the the brilliant things about the Extinction Rebellion uh, was that the question that they had to gov to government wasn't you know we want you to stop fracking or we want you to do this or we want you to do that it was like you know we want you to tell the people the truth and if you tell the people the truth, then, you know, maybe every garden club in Britain can get themselves organized. You, know, you get the WI organized, you get the scouts and the guides and whatever. And that fabric uh, of British society, um, uh, faith communities, etc. I mean, that that's how Britain organizes itself. And we're going to need everybody. So, you know, we, we don't want to have a sort of yobbish culture about, you know, I'm not going to make my house efficient. You know, we, we need the, yeah, everybody's going to do it. And it's, you know, everybody's going to help everybody else do it. And we're not asking you to sacrifice. We're asking you to save money on your electricity bills. Um, so my father at one point uh, was an energy uh, efficiency um, auditor. So this is in the early days of energy efficiency when the EU had a scheme where they were helping. Um, and you could, you could get EU money to uh, help um, local authorities go and look at the energy efficiency of their housing stock. And this is at a time when the Tories were wanting to make these into housing associations. And of course, that was important to understand before they were sort of quote unquote privatized. But he would go around public housing, I remember Lewisham, you know, parts of Birmingham, whatever, and go house to house, you know, and just look at the efficiency. And he saw you know, I mean, he has, he has an extraordinary array of stories about things that he saw, you know, uh, people having just put their foot through the back doors to let the cat out um, and then wondering why the cold air is blowing in and everything like that. But, you know, this is a long story uh, around um, di different sort of piecemeal attempts to get the basics right. And, you know, I do, I do think there's a moment for leadership in terms of like, we actually don't have time to have piecemeal efforts anymore. This is something that we need to do. We need to do a certain degree of urgency and everybody could be involved. And, and you know, I think there's a way to do that that is 
building of a kind of solidarity rather than eroding of it. I think I definitely agree that, you know, on the, the importance of that kind of cultural shift, from, you know, in America, there's this thing called rolling smoke where you burn diesel and you create a huge plume of smoke out of your, your vast truck. And that's regarded as cool. And then you contrast that with Japan. I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to get the word right, but there's a word called motainai, which is the pride in being efficient, in, in yeah. recycling and being frugal and so on. And, you know, those are sort of two bookends of cultural engagement in, in, in resource use. And clearly... You know, you sort of think, oh my God, you, know, what, 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 um, you sort of think, oh my goodness, wouldn't it be great if we worked up, woke up in a world where Americans thought that the dimension of competition, you know, you make America great again by being frugal, by saving your your natural resources, uh, by having the lightest footprint on the earth, and and being, you know, and and displaying your success through you know other ways cultural or, or, or whatever uh, anyway one can always dream about those things i think you're being a bit generous to extinction rebellion so i agree with the need for the cultural change um but i see i think they sort of had a chance to capture some mainstream space but then they blew it by just displaying the fact that actually they're just old school anti-capitalists and they are actually the yobs, maybe not putting their foot through the door to let the cat out, but, you know, stopping people from getting to work, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and um, yeah. displaying an extraordinary level of privilege and also not understanding, you know, because I come at it as an analyst and say, well, you know, but they said, let's be, you know, net zero by 2050 is not good enough, 2025. And they don't realize that, you know, fertilizer is made with natural gas. We don't have another way of making it at this point. There are no electric tractors. They don't exist. The only way to get food into the cities where they all love to live and hang out, the only way is actually, at the moment, a fossil fuel-powered distribution system. And 2025 is five years away. So we know what ideological, top-down, handbrake turns in agriculture and resource use look like. They look like Great Leap Forward, Holodomor, collectivization disaster they're really I mean, and, and it's easy to kind of say oh you know michael's exaggerating not. but but that is that is what happens when you ideologically and through you know sort of mob rule do these things so i personally have a real i i, I think that you know the calls greta saying you know, listen to the science brilliant but when you you have people saying listen to the science and the science says we've got to you know We've got to do these these extraordinarily disruptive things. We're really motivated just by uh, breaking the status quo. Then, to me, you know, you have to count me out. And maybe you have more sympathy yeah. for it. No, I mean, I think, I mean, that, that was uh, my my window into that narrative was in the early days of the rebellion. And clearly, like any movement, there's been splinters and there's different pushing and pulling within the leadership. And now, I think. Uh, a lot of the leadership have, have gone and, and set up something else. But uh, I, I think that the frustration and the urgency, I think the urgency had an impact. It certainly had an impact uh, on, uh, on, on the government at the time. So I think that's fine. I think young people uniting with older, the older generation, I think that's really actually good and a socially, you know, a fabric which, would need, which needed to be strengthened. And then the fact that there's sort of these... You know, the, these all these county towns in Britain, you know, with assemblies and things like that. I think that's that pos that's positive as well. So yeah, I mean, I don't condone all of the tactical decisions that were made, but I think you know, it, I think it's quite profound. You, you're the government of the people. Tell the people the truth. You're sitting all the data and the evidence. What is all this waffling? You know, tell. Them but when the you say the evidence, I mean, I, I'm sorry, I'm just too distracted. There's one of the founders of um, of Extinction Rebellion. There's a fantastic YouTube clip. He jumps on a table in front of a bunch of I don't know, eleven year olds, and tell them that tells them that when people ask what you want to be when you grow up, you should answer them saying, if I grow up, because of climate change. Oh, and there's nothing, there's nothing in the science that says that an 11-year-old, no. a posh 11-year-old in Britain, is not going to grow up because of climate change. That's not what the science says. So I'm distracted by that. I'm overly distracted, maybe. But, you know, coming back to the Fletcher School and this question of leadership, you've yeah. said, um, you know, we need to be able, this is something we can definitely, definitely agree on, 
We need to be able to put the best global leaders we can on the field of play today. Um, you know, you're, you're producing students and you're sending them out into the world where, you know, you could sort of, how do you make sure that you don't prepare them for this kind of, to be the best they can be and to lead on all of these issues. And then they go out into a world which rewards tribalism and populism, where one side is saying climate change doesn't exist and, uh, and, and trying to essentially, I mean, you know, foment division in one way. And on the other side, you've got people who want to jump on the desk and tell 11 year olds they're gonna die uh, before they reach adulthood because frankly, that is what gets them rewards in their environment. So aren't you sort of, you know, isn't there a risk that you're sort of like a first world war general, you know, just not giving your students the right tools to fight in the, in the, the leadership battles that they will actually face will be around, tri- you know, sort of will be tribal wars in a sense and not yeah. great inclusive sort of social democrat center left center right wars that you and i would like you know to the environment to be yeah no so i think that i mean that's a very a good point i think that my my role as the dean is to sort of hold the center so that you know even though um you know i think many uh, academic campuses and certainly in the united states are sort of seen to be left of center or um oh, that's, my, that's my dog uh, <laughs> That, that, that there has to be a space where all views can be interrogated and you have to be able to look at, a, look at an issue from a 360 degree perspective, which means being able to look at it from an interdisciplinary perspective. So knowing enough about the law to be able to interrogate it, knowing enough about uh, economics to be interrogated, enough about finance, enough about uh, security, etc. cetera. So we, we've, we're, we're sort of known for our interdisciplinary approach. And so what I want uh, students to do in the time that they're with us is really hone their analytical capability and their critical thinking because they're going to need that wherever they go. And about a third of our students go into the private sector, a third go into sort of international organisations or international NGOs or whatever, and a third would go into the foreign services or the international departments of treasuries or whatever of their own governments. And half the student body is international and half is US. So yeah, these are they're going to they're going to have international careers, and they need to be able to interrogate uh, interrogate every situation and be they need to be able to put themselves in the shoes of the people with whom they're arguing or you know people from another tribe or people they're negotiating with. What young people today are asking for is they want all of that, but they want really hard skills. I mean, we're they're going into a world where big data, machine learning, and AI is going to transform everything. Whether you want a career in energy or agriculture or whether you want to be a traditional diplomat, you have to understand some of that. So they want many more hard skills in addition to that sort of analytical capability. Uh, and, I, you know, and I think there's, there's some real structural issues about higher education in the United States in that most people have to indebt themselves to get an education, which, is, which it didn't used to be. Uh, and I think there's something profoundly uncompetitive in the US economy if that's what we're doing to the next generation. So I have to find solutions to that. But I, I want you to come, I want you to be able to interrogate an issue from any perspective. Uh, I think that we were traditionally known as having a conservative uh, part of the school, which I think is really, really important because we have to be able to respect different views. Um, and you then need to be able to deploy that skill when you go out into the world. Um, as you were speaking, I was kind of thinking, well, when I framed that as, you know, the world is getting more and more polarized i realized that i built an assumption into that question because actually polarization has waxed and waned and you know if you think back to you know as i often do when i was you know five years old 1968 you know the, 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 there was enormous polarization in the 60s right and then it kind of you know we, we nevertheless got through that and had some times which were not as so do you think that i suppose to a certain extent it's going to depend on what happens in the the outcome of the US election, maybe, but do you think maybe I was being pessimistic by framing it as the world is just going to get more and more polarized, more and more tribal? And particularly as you see different demographics coming through into leadership positions minorities, women, people with much more diverse backgrounds, which I'm sure is a trend that you're seeing in your student body. 
Is that going to change it? Are we going to see those? Are they going to kind of join the tribes or are they going to actually break all of that up? Well, we've definitely got a trend of populism, right? Um, uh, which is meaning that in a, n- a number of key economies are looking inward um, and that that populism is coming with xenophobia, it's coming with uh, a sort of um, you know, anti-democratic uh, bent, uh, whether on the left or the right, right? So, so that's definitely a phenomenon. Within the United States, I, I think that... Um, for all kinds of reasons, we're, we're sort of shouting at each other louder and we're shouting past each other more and more. And the, the centre the center has kind of eroded on, on any issue. Um, and so you get pushed. You get pushed to, to, the, to the sides, as it were. And then the only technique available to you is to sort of shout on Twitter or shout on social media or, or then, of course, be in your own bubble. So you're, you're having your views, you know, uh, reinforced uh, every minute of every day. Um, and I think that's really, so when you're taking students who, I mean, the average age of a student coming into Fletcher is, about, is 28. So they're company, they've, they've done their undergraduate degree, they've been out in the world and they've done something and now they're coming back for their international affairs degree and then they're going to go off and either pivot or, or pursue um, their degree at, at a higher level, uh, their career at a higher level. So they're coming, they're mature, right? But they, they are swimming in that, in, in that uh, they're swimming in that water. And so just reminding ourselves that, you know, negotiation, uh, how to talk to each other, how to listen. And then you've got the issue of diversity. So international, international uh, affairs education is, um, you know, is a construct. The canon was written in the middle of the 20th century by white men. And so the decolonization uh, or the decolonialization of international relations is an issue which has been sort of at the top of the agenda for about four or five years now. Uh, well, that's very challenging for many people within international relations, and it's challenging for schools like ours. But that's, I think, very exciting because you're talking about bringing different perspectives to the table to look at how things are and understanding where you came from and why we are where we are and in order to be able to understand where to go forward. But... Uh, the State Department, for example, the last few days has been has been article after article after article in the mainstream press in the U.S. about how far it has not come in diversifying. So the diplomats of the United States are mainly uh, 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 straight white men, right? Still uh, to this day, and some of the uh, stories for people who aren't that uh, are quite challenging in terms of building a career. So. Th- these issues that raised to the to fore, and they they haven't gone away. Um, and I think it's interesting. I mean, I'm I'm uh, I'm an out lesbian, you know, energy diplomat activist, climate activist, whatever you want. You know, not your traditional pick for a dean of a school of international affairs, the oldest school of international affairs in the U.S. And you know, you feel the responsibility of just you know telling people um, that you can piece together a career and that you can deal with these issues. Now I have to deal with issues of the fact that I have no uh, black American tenured faculty at, at, at Fletcher. We've got an extraordinary distance to travel still. Um, but I think that building the space to hear each other and trying to get dialogue back into the political system in the US is absolutely fundamental. It is a deeply, deeply corrupt political system, which is one reason why there's such little social trust and why one reason, I mean, the, the, the impact of money on politics in this country. I've lived in the US for 20 years, and, and over those 20 years, and Citizens United uh, being the pivotal Supreme Court, I mean, yeah. I, I think it's very difficult for Europeans to just quite understand what money in politics has done here. Do you know, it's funny because I have said in the past, if you gave me um, one kind of, uh, one wish to accelerate the transition um, mm-hmm. towards clean energy, clean transportation, it would be campaign reform principally in the US. I think if you just do that, yeah. then all of these trends, uh, and of course trends on inclusion and, and so on, will also they'll just accelerate. But are you not getting a sense of some deja vu all over again? Because the energy industry and the development industry was also very, very, um, uh, it was very straight, it was very white, it was very, I mean, the energy industry, the conventional energy industry is extraordinarily reactionary. And then 
clean energy and clean transportation suddenly opens up spaces of innovation, yeah. whether it's new technology, and therefore there's kind of younger people understand machine learning and older people don't, and therefore they're, you know, suddenly you start to see women coming in and more minorities. Um, and, you know, you were kind of in an environment that was just getting, becoming more diverse. And now, do you not feel that you're kind of having to, you're going to go through, you know, you sort of gone back 10 years in the time machine and will now have to accelerate accelerate it forward have you seen in the last six weeks since the tragic death of george floyd um you know have you started to change the way you do things and think about different ways that you can accelerate the trends uh within fletcher uh well yes i mean i i when i came into the role i knew that uh diversity and inclusion was going to need to be a top priority if it wasn't already And I sort of allowed myself sort of 90 days, 100 days to sort of like learn my way into a new industry and a new organization uh, and then started uh, some steps to to move forward with that and and, made a couple of missteps as well. Um, And so and then and then, you know, we went into lockdown and then the um, the uh, unlawful killing of George Floyd brings everything into relief once again. And so. What I've had to do is double down on this is a priority and this has to stay. And every morning I have to make sure that I am moving that agenda forward. Um, and, you know, it has to be a collective effort because in, in academia, you know, we, we all have to move together. Right. So I have to bring the, uh, the community along. And that what I didn't uh, what I didn't know and what I've had to learn and I need to continue to learn and listen to is the depth of the anger and the depth of the frustration and the depth of the pain, frankly, of uh, black alumni, of uh, alumni of colour, of uh, the, the um, black and, uh, st- staff uh, of colour at the Fletcher and the uh, current students as well. So uh, that, that's been humbling and I needed to go through, I, I needed to learn that. It wasn't their responsibility to teach me, but I've got to, um, got to move the school forward. So that, that's fine. And I think I think on the, on the issues of, uh, you know, the, en- the energy industry, I mean, it was like this in banking when I worked at the IFC, you know, and then it was like this in energy. Um, and I think that, you know, uh, it, you know, it's, you're always, frankly, you know, you have good days and bad days. And so, you know, you can still walk into a room and be the only woman or be the only, I mean, it's, you've got a non-visible difference. You're not sure if you're the only one or not, but... Uh, I, I think that um, I'm, I'm sort of fairly used to that. It used to it used to get exhausting, I think, um, in energy ministerials, because uh, I, I would really look around the room and thinking, well, if you were building a boardroom, you would never build this board. And if this is the ministerial for energy and we need an energy transition, then this is really not, with no disrespect to anybody in the room, this is not the board you would build for the energy transition. And I think that's where it becomes uh, yeah. particularly difficult. Oh, I mean, I I remember being in Davos uh, in a room of, I don't know what it was, 110 people building the future of transportation with you know five <laughs> women and no people of colour. And in just thinking, well, you're not going to build, you know, you're just not going to do it, are you? You're just really not actually very serious. And, and, and I certainly, you know, as you talked about the black alumni and so on, I, I think I've, you know, I, I was supposed to have my um, 30th Harvard Business School reunion was supposed to be this summer. And I can say I am really glad that uh, it has been uh, postponed because, frankly, doing that in the, you know, in in the Mm -hmm. environment um, of uh, a U.S. presidential election, which is just so extraordinarily uh, polarized. And, you know, I'm I'm sad to say probably more than half of my peers from Harvard Business School, I suspect, will be voting Trump. And will be, you know, sympathetic to this kind of, you know, don't know what they're all on about and it's all nonsense. And then, you know, and I go back, I think back to the time when I was at uh, graduate school in the US. And um, and I, I, I don't know, I'm not sure that I'm not sure whether the right response is to want to apologize to my black classmates because I, you know, I certainly was was not in a, uh, I was I was not an offender in any way. But equally, I was not as aware and as. Um, you know, the, the, the openness and the dialogue was not there um, absolutely clearly. And that's something that I want to remedy, but I don't know how. And I've, and I've got to kind of think through that. So I'm, you know, I'm hoping to, hoping to you know, it's a bit of a, a journey, I think, that all of us are on 
um, interrogating the way we have been over the last few decades. I did a lot of work, as you know, we worked together on women in energy, women yeah, in clean the Hawth- energy, the Hawthorne um, Club, yeah. the, the Hawthorne Club. Uh, you know, pushing for 30% thought leaders at the Bloomberg New Energy Finance Summit. 30% might not sound great now, but I tell you, when I started to push for that, the equivalent um, conference in uh, which was um, IHS Zero Week uh, in oh, yeah. Houston had 7% women thought leaders, seven. And we were pushing for 30 and it took us a few years and we got there. So, you know, we've done lots of things, particularly t- together on, on women. But then I suppose the question will be, have we done the same on, on gender uh, LBGT uh, and and also on minorities. And I look at myself and I think, you know what? No. Even though I worked on Africa and the developing world, I probably didn't really delve in and think about the biases and the inclusion uh, and the empowerment of, you know, colleagues across the board, you know, in, in our own environment. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, I, I worked, uh, we, we had huge diversity issues at the IFC and at the World Bank when I was there. And, um, you know, the, 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 the thing that was always really difficult was the representation of African Americans or people of color from the United States. You know, we could, uh, w- once we sort of got better at diversity, we were, we were bringing in really talented Africans. And we had to really work at the pipeline and really work at making the bank group an attractive place for them to come. Uh, but where I think we, we really struggled was on bringing into the World Bank group um, people of colour from the US. And, you know, and I didn't, you know, I mean, objectively didn't do enough, uh, needed to understand why, hadn't done enough. And I think, you know, it's interesting now to be in this role because, you know, uh, if, if, you, if you, you have choices, if you are um, uh, uh, a young person of colour and, and wanting to pursue an international relations career, and so I have to make the Fletcher School the place you want to come. It's not just about me opening the door and then they're all going to come flooding through, right? I mean, I've got to make it a place where you want to come, which means that we do have to have more diverse faculty. We do need to be having different perspectives in the syllabi and in the curriculum. We do have to understand the origins of the theories of international relations. We do have to be able to critique them. Um, and so we have to do all of that. Um, and uh, it has to be it has to be an attractive place for the best people to come and want to work in terms of the staff, uh, and it has to be the kind of place where you want to come and be supported if you're junior faculty or senior faculty. So, it, it's, we're not going to do it in a day, but we've we've got to sort of you know we can't just use the problems of you know budget or tenure or whatever as excuses to not do it. We, we've now just got to say that's enough, and now we are going to move forward. And I think we'll be. Will be a better school for it in the end. Um, uh, so I, I, I still have alumni who think that I'm watering down the school, right? I mean, this sort of affirmative action argument that you know suddenly I'm going to let in you know people who wouldn't you know be there in the first place. Well, I think it's actually the opposite because I think if you're smart, then you, you can command a premium uh, because everybody wants you at the moment. So um, so yeah, work work to do and lots yeah. of personal work as well. And I think. You put your finger on it, work to do. It does feel to me like it's a different um, moment um, that the, you know, finally now there really does appear to be a consensus in society that there is a real problem. And although there'll be some old alumni or uh, some some uh, incumbents also in the energy space or transportation, all the areas that, that I work in or in banking or in policy making, there will be some, you know, holdouts. There's no question. But my sense is that the herd has started to move and uh, that, that as leaders, we shouldn't be moving with it. We should be doing what, you know, you talked about it, building the pipeline, doing the work. And I think it's also got to start when, you know, when I started to work on on getting women thought leaders uh, and women into leadership positions at uh, New Energy Finance, Bloomberg New Energy Finance, the first step is actually to talk about it. The first yeah. step is just to be able to talk and to open up the conversation and say, this you know, this is not off limits. This is a thing we talk about as a team, as a company, as an organization. So uh, I, I really um, wish you luck with that. I think it's it, it's it's an incredibly important piece of your job, um, probably more than you thought when you joined, but that's the right thing. Yeah, Rachel, again, I think it's yeah. getting, I just have to get out of the way of the students because they kind of get it. Uh, they're, they're intersectional in the, way that, in the way that they think about the world, you know, issues of gender and race class are all sort of mixed into one melange for them in a way that it wasn't for us growing up. So again, part of my job is to just get out of the way and hold the door open for them. 
Well, as there was, uh, the old adage goes, I can't remember which French uh, leader said it, but, um, you know, there go the people. I must follow them for I am their leader. So uh, exactly. yeah, that's what you're going to have to do. Look, Rachel, it's always a huge uh, pleasure to talk to you, to catch up. Um, we've got so much more that we could talk about. There's probably eight different topics that we could uh, uh, spend an evening on that we've opened up there and that we've touched on. But unfortunately, time is passing. Uh, you've got a big job to do. Uh, it's late here in Europe, so I've got some big jobs to do as well, but they're less important than yours. Um, but I'd like to thank you for joining us on our second episode of Cleaning Up. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Michael. Take care. So our guest next week on Cleaning Up is going to be Anthony Slumbers. Now, Anthony is not a clean energy or climate person. He'd be the first to admit that. But he is an expert on real estate. Now, real estate is at the epicenter of change, both because of climate, because of technology, and because of COVID-19 and our need for social distancing and safe places to work. So I hope you join me next week for our third episode of Cleaning Up with Anthony Slumbers. Thank you and good night.